Greetings, friends and neighbors, and welcome to the Community Solutions Podcast, episode number 22. We come to you from the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the Indiana University Fairbanks School of Public Health in beautiful downtown Indianapolis. It's a gorgeous day here. I am Jack Terman Jr., your host for the podcast and a member of the faculty of this great department. We hope that you are having a joy-filled, beautiful day. This season, our students lead discussions about books they have read, all of which have pieces of wisdom to share about building and sustaining healthy, hope-filled communities. As I'm putting this season together, I know that many students are having discussions about the importance of thoughtful, empowering communication strategies. Today, our students Kelsey and Emily have a conversation about the book Nonviolent Communication, A Language of Life by the late Marshall B. Rosenberg. This discussion is so important for our present times. This book stresses the importance of honest, intentional communication that is really grounded in giving and receiving empathy and prioritizing a healthy relationship between all participants. Emily and Kelsey do a nice job of highlighting examples of nonviolent communication and stress the importance of using this strategy to advance public health and community development. Let's all remember that it is healthy and normal to engage in dialogue with community members that have different strong opinions and visions for them moving their community forward. The strategy discussed in our podcast today is a great caring way to mediate these vital discussions so that all move forward as a collective whole. Please share our podcast with others and keep listening. Let's join the conversation. Hi, I'm Emily and I have Kelsey with me here today and we are going to be discussing the book Nonviolent Communication, A Language of Life by the late Marshall B. Rosenberg. And we're going to be talking about how the concepts discussed in this book relate to public health and public health action. So I don't know about you, Emily, but I really enjoyed reading this book. Yeah, me too. I feel like this is a book you have to read more than once in order to really grasp the information and be able to apply it into practice. I definitely agree. Despite the title, I feel like what's in this book can be used for more than just conflict resolution techniques. Yeah, so just to give some context to our listeners, nonviolent communication is the process of communicating in a way that is non judgmental, expresses empathy and compassion, and communicates needs. And um, from here on out, we will be referring to nonviolent communication as NVC. So there are four components of the NVC process these include observation feeling, needs, and request. Observation consists of objectively stating what we observe and whether or not it contributes to our well-being. It's important to separate observation from your own evaluations. When we combine evaluation with observation, people are more apt to hear criticism. Feelings include an emotion or sensation rather than a thought in relation to what is observed. Needs, rather than preference, are what cause our feelings. Often negative feelings arise when our needs or values are not being met. Finally, requests are are the concrete actions you would like taken by the other person. Through this process, it is important that we don't judge the situation or the other person, but that we objectively observe the situation and decide whether our needs are being met. If they are not being met, we can make a request from the other person to help meet our needs and we can do the same for them. So there's two other parts to NVC that go along with the four components Emily just talked about. The first is expressing honesty through the four components. However, I think this practice seems much easier said than done. In the book, Rosenberg says, the essence of NVC is our consciousness of the four components, not in the actual words that are exchanged. By using the four components Emily discussed earlier, participants of NVC are able to better identify and express their needs in an honest and compassionate manner. The second part of NVC is receiving empathetically through the four components. 
In order to receive empathetically, you must first be able to be empathetic to your own needs and requests. Practicing empathy on yourself will help you to better be able to receive empathetically through the important four components. So just to demonstrate the use of NVC, we're going to read some dialogue from the book about how a woman used NVC to defuse a dangerous situation. While this, is, while this is an example of an extreme situation, it shows the use of NVC in more than just communicating better with your spouse. Keep in mind this is a true story of NVC in action. We'd also like to warn our listeners that the story we're about to tell is about sexual harassment and could be a trigger for some listeners. Also, we have deleted some words that some listeners may find offensive. Let's set the scene. A teacher in the inner city of St. Louis relayed an incident where she had knowingly stayed after school to help a student, even though teachers were warned for their own safety, to leave the building after classes were dismissed. A stranger entered the classroom. I will be playing the role of the stranger, and Emily will be playing the role of the teacher. The following is what took place. Take off your clothes. I could notice that the young man was shaking, so I said, I'm sensing this is very scary for you. Did you hear me? Take off your clothes. I'm sensing you're really angry right now and you want me to do what you're telling me. You're right, and you're going to get hurt if you don't. I'd like you to tell me if there's some other way of meeting your needs that wouldn't hurt me. I said take them off. I can hear how much you want this. At the same time, I want you to know how scared and horrible I feel, and how grateful I'd be if you'd leave without hurting me. (sighs) Give me your purse. The teacher then handed the stranger her purse, relieved not to be raped. She later described how... Each time she empathized with a young man, she could sense him becoming less adamant in his intention to follow through with the rape. So as Emily said earlier, that was a rather intense example of NVC. So let's talk about, let's talk some more about the use of NVC in our daily lives. Yeah, so I've been using NVC to better communicate with people whose political opinions I disagree with. And although NVC seems really awkward and unrealistic, It's important to keep in mind that our perceptions of NVC are altered by the way in which our culture has shaped communication. For example, our culture doesn't place a high value on direct, honest, intentional communication. We often find this communication style to be really uncomfortable. However, with practice, NVC will begin to feel more natural and less scripted. That seems like it would be really beneficial. I'm using it with one of my friends right now. She's going through a lot and I just want to be there for her more empathetically. But as you said, Emily, NVC is also great when discussing more controversial issues, which a lot of public health topics are. Yeah, totally, Kel. There are a ton of politically charged, controversial public health issues, like abortion, vaccines, drug use, reproductive health, HIV, AIDS, and the list goes on. So how can we use NVC to better address public health issues? That's such a great question, Emily. A lot of times, public health officials interact with many different people of varying beliefs and opinions, and NVC can be used to better understand the needs of community members, policymakers, health professionals, and community partners. Yeah, that's a great idea. Also, it can be used within communities. For example, when communities hold town hall meetings to discuss hot topics and how these topics may affect the well-being of community members, NVC can be used to diffuse any tension among individuals with passionate opposing views. So we'd like to give our great listeners another example of NVC in action. This script is also an example given in the book that depicts the conversation of smoking cessation between two friends. This example shows how NVC can be used for public health initiatives at an individual level. So once again, let's set the scene. Al and Bert have been best friends for over 30 years. Al, a non-smoker, has done everything he can over the years to persuade Bert to give up his two-pack-a-day habit. Aware during the past year of the increased severity of his friend's hacking cough, Al finds himself bursting out one day with all the energy and life that had been buried in his unexpressed anger and fear. So I'll play the role of Bert, and Kelsey will play the role of Al. Bert, I know we've talked about this a dozen times, but listen, I'm scared your cigarettes are going to kill you. You're my best friend, and I want you around for as long as I can have you. Please don't think I'm judging you. I'm not. I'm just really worried. No, I hear your concern. We've been friends for a long time. Making a request, I say, would you be willing to quit? I wish I could. Listening for the feelings and needs preventing Bert from agreeing to the request, I say, are you scared to try because you don't want to fail? Yeah, you know how many times I've tried before. I know people think less of me for not being able to quit. 
Guessing at what Bert might want to request, I say, I don't think less of you, and if you tried and failed again, I still wouldn't. I just wish you'd try. Thanks, but you're not the only one. It's everyone. You can see it in their eyes. They think you're a failure. Empathizing with Bert's feelings, I say, is it kind of overwhelming to worry about what others might think when just quitting is hard enough? I really hate the idea that I might be addicted, that I have something that I just can't control. Al's eyes connect with Bert's. He nods his head. Al's interest and attention to Bert's deep feelings and needs are revealed through his eyes and the silence that follows. I mean, I don't even like smoking anymore. It's like you're a pariah if you do it in public. It's embarrassing. Continuing to empathize, I say, it sounds like you'd really like to quit, but are scared you might fail, and how that would be for your self-image and confidence. Yeah, I guess that's it. You know, I don't think I've ever talked about it before. Usually when people tell me to quit, I just tell them to get lost. I'd like to quit, but I don't want all that pressure from people. I wouldn't want to pressure you. I don't know if I could reassure you about your fears around not succeeding, but I sure would like to support you in any way I can. That is, if you want me to. Yeah, I do, and I'm really touched by your concern and, will and willingness. But suppose I'm not ready to try yet. Is that okay, too? Of course. Bert, I still like you as much. It's just that I want to like you for longer. So, that scene was a little bit different than the one you previously heard, as you can tell. Because Al's request was a genuine request, not a demand, he maintained awareness of his commitment to the quality of the relationship, regardless of Bert's response. He expressed this awareness and his respect for Bert's needs for autonomy through his words, I'll still like you, while simultaneously expressing his own need, to like you for longer. That scenario is a great example of giving and receiving empathetically, which is what we've learned is vital to NVC. So here are some key points that you can apply when using NVC in your work or personal life. Listen empathetically. Identify and express needs. Listen for requests. And use compassion. So to wrap up our great discussion today, I think I can speak for myself and Emily when I say that we will use NVC in our future public health careers and in our personal lives. We hope that everyone listening found this podcast to be a beneficial use of your time and that you look more into nonviolent communication with Marshall B. Rosenberg and how it may apply to your life. Thanks for listening. <laughs>